you for your patience, everyone. We will go ahead and call the committee back to order. And the first item of business is the adoption of committee rules. We had touched on this briefly on Tuesday when we met, and the committee rules have been revised from last session, primarily in regards to committee members being present to hear and work bills that this session pursuant to what the Senate President has asked of our committees and committee chairs that members may participate in the hearing of a bill remotely as long as they are in the State House. However, to work a bill, you have to be physically present in the committee meeting room. And those committee rules will be posted on the committee website after the meeting today, and they have all been distributed to committee members digitally, electronically. So uh, with that, we will adopt the Judi Senate Judiciary 2022 committee rules. And then I will ask for re any, request, any request for bill introductions from any committee member. How about anyone in the audience have a request for bill introduction? Anyone online has a request for bill introduction? I don't see any then, so we will move on to the next order of business, which is hearing on HB 2228, which comes over to us from the House, and we'll ask Mr. Reviser, Mr. Jason Thompson, for a bill brief. All right. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, committee. Uh, your very first bill of the new session here. So uh, House Bill 2228 comes to you from uh, the House Committee on Judiciary and the House, and it was amended over there. Uh, it requires law enforcement agencies to adopt a policy regarding the submission of sexual assault evidence kits and allows evidence collection at child advocacy centers and other facilities. Uh, there's a new section, uh, number one, that requires law enforcement agencies to adopt some written policies uh, that require submission of all sexual assault kits that are uh, corresponding to a law enforcement report of sexual assault, and they have to submit those to an accredited forensic laboratory. Um, the policy shall ensure that the kits are submitted within 30 business days from the collection of the kit uh, for examination and have some procedures to ensure that results are received by the investigating officer. Uh, all the agencies in the state are required to collaborate with their appropriate county or district attorney regarding their policies and make them available to their employees and to the public. And finally, those policies must be adopted and implemented prior to July 1 of 2022. I'll note this is a carryover bill, so uh, that might be a little ambitious uh, given that it was introduced in 2021. That might have been uh, why it was 2022. So um, one potential thing you might want to look at is whether that should be 2023, given that we're now in 2022. So I just wanted to flag that as one of the small carryover issues uh, in this bill. Um, section 2 then amends uh, KSA 38-2227, and this is just to require child advocacy, advocacy centers to be recognized by the National Children's Alliance and also to allow for evidence collection uh, at those centers, uh, including sexual assault evidence collection, um, and also uh, to make sure that those centers provide referrals for medical exam services or evidence collection services that, that cannot be done at that center. Um, so that's the amendment there. That statute, of course, is part of our Child Need of Care Code, uh, but that's um, the only amendment made is related to these child advocacy centers and these sexual assault evidence kits, so that's why it's in this bill. And then finally, uh, Section 3 amends KSA 65-448, and that's the statute that deals with sexual assault evidence collection. Uh, this would also allow those evidence collections uh, to occur at child advocacy centers. And uh, as amended by the House Committee on Judiciary, uh, it would allow these evidence collections at any other facility operated by a physician, physician assistant, or registered nurse that's licensed under our state law in Chapter 65 of the statutes. Uh, and then there's a... Um, a piece about unreported sexual assault kits needing to be retained by the Kansas Bureau of Investigation. The current law is five years, and this would make that 20 years. So that amendment is also in that section. 
Um, with that, I think I'll just make one quick uh, reminder. Again, this is a carryover bill from last year, so there is a technical update that would be needed to these statutes, um, mostly to change the dates of the supplement to 2021, but a couple other small things that you might want to consider, like the date of the policies that I referenced at the very beginning. Um, and so I, I have a balloon prepared at the request of the chairperson whenever you uh, were to consider this, so you could see those technical updates. Um, and on, other than that, I'll see if you have any questions and stand aside for the long list of conferees. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. And I will remind the committee this was scheduled for hearing last session. It was scheduled for March 26th due to the press of some other business. We weren't as a committee able to get to it. It did pass out of the House 124 to 0. And it's, it's an important update and tool needed and requested by our law enforcement community. So it's something that we're prioritizing and making it our, our first bill to work on uh, this session. So with that, are there any questions for the reviser? Seeing none then, thank you very much. And we will ask our first proponent, conferee Robert Jacobs, the Executive Officer of the Kansas Bureau of Investigation. Welcome to committee. I can take this off. Thank you. Good morning, Chairman, or sorry, Chairwoman Wolf Warren <laughs> and members of the committee. My name is Robert Jacobs. I serve as the Executive Officer of the Kansas Bureau of Investigation, and I appreciate this opportunity to present testimony in favor of House Bill 2228. Before I begin with this testimony, I'd, or before with the House Bill, I would really like to provide a little context to the history of how this bill came about for you. In 2014, the KBI began an effort to try and identify the number of unsubmitted sexual assault kits um, that were in the state. Unsubmitted kits are kits where a victim goes to a hospital, has a uh, sexual assault evidence collection collected. That kit is then turned over to law enforcement, but somehow that kit did not end up in, uh, with being submitted to a laboratory for testing. So this was actually a nationwide effort. Kansas was one of the leading states in the nation to go after this effort and to look into the, the issue of unsubmitted sexual assault kits. This program was called the Sexual Assault Kit Initiative, or SAKI. Many of you have probably heard of that. Through that project, 2,200 sexual assault kits were identified um, in law enforcement's custody. Between 2015 and 2019, Kansas law enforcement worked diligently to submit those kits to our forensic laboratories. And we're referring to three different forensic laboratories in the state. The Johnson County Criminal, uh, Sheriff's Office Criminalistics Laboratory, the Cedric County Regional Forensic Science Center, and the KBI. Law enforcement personnel continue today to prioritize sexual assault kits and turn those in. Um, I think that that was one of the things that came out of the efforts and they recognized the importance of, of submitting those, those kits. Part of the Saki project was to develop a multidisciplinary team to help guide the Saki project. That team uh, was charged with several different things, one being to guide the Saki project, but also to determine issues and recommendations um, that they would make for future, uh, sock, or future sexual assault response and legislative um, changes that were needed. That multidisciplinary group was made up of prosecutors, law enforcement, um, forensic scientists, and community and system-based advocacy groups. The provisions of House Bill 2228 are, come directly from many of those recommendations that came from the Saki Working Group, as well as national best practices and standards that had been developed. Three specific recommendations came, uh, through the rec or came from the Saki Working Group. The first was that all sexual assault kits should be submitted to a laboratory. So all sexual assault kits, and, I, and I will, I'll differentiate here, we're talking about reported sexual assault kits to law enforcement that are then submitted to the laboratory. We'll talk about unreported here in a minute. The second recommendation was that forensic laboratories should test or examine all of those sexual assault kits that are submitted to them. 
And the final recommendation was that when we talk about unsubmitted or un unreported sexual assault kits, that the statute that per KSA 65448, those kits are only retained for five years. We, the recommendation was to move that from five years to 20 years. So we'll talk about submit all sexual assault kits. Section one of House Bill 2228 directs all law enforcement agencies uh, in Kansas to adopt a policy to require the submission of sexual of reported sexual assault kits to the lab within for, within 30 business days, and it can be any one of those three labs. We landed on 30 business days because we talked about we talked to law enforcement and we looked at resources and things like that. But we believe that 30 days is equivalent is enough time to get those those kits into our forensic laboratories. Test all submit or test all sexual assault kits. It's a, what they did find in the Saki project uh, through CODIS hits and things like that is that many of these kits were related and these offenses were related to serial offenders in Kansas. So the only way to determine that and to get those, that DNA into the CODIS system is to submit and test those kits. So our recommendation is that all reported sexual assault kits that are submitted to the lab must be examined. The third recommendation uh, talked about increasing the amount of time that KBI retains unreported kits. Currently in Kansas, when a victim goes to a hospital or a medical facility to have sexual, after, a, after an assault, to have evidence collection done, that victim, he or she, has the opportunity and the choice to report that incident to law enforcement or to not report that to law enforcement. If they choose not to report it to law enforcement, the medical provider will then submit that kit directly to the KBI Forensic Laboratory in an anonymous fashion. It has a unique identifying number on it. And that kit is retained by the KBI, not processed, not examined, but just is stored with them for five years per KSA 65448. We don't examine those kits because we have no way to tie that back to a law enforcement agency or to report those results out. We keep those kits because at some point subsequent to that, to that day or when they submit that kit, if that victim ever wants to then report that crime to law enforcement, law enforcement then contacts the KBI, we, we, it gives us that unique number, we convert that kit to a testable kit and we, we examine the kit and test it. And then it moves through the criminal justice system. The, the importance of moving it from five years is that when this statute, 65448, was written, the, the, many of the crimes, sexual assault crimes in Kansas, only had a statute of limitations for five years. In 2013, Kansas extended and actually eliminated the statute of limitations on rape. So when we talk about having evidence that we would destroy after five years, long before the statute of limitations was, was exempt or over, that, con that was concerning to us. According to the National Institute of Justice, one of their publications titled National Best Practices for Sexual Assault Kits, they recommended that sexual assault kits be kept for 20 years or the end of the statute of limitation whichever is the lesser of the two times. In Kansas, that would be 20 years, which is why we ended with the, the recommendation of keeping those kits from five years to 20 years. This is also consistent with the Federal Survivors Bill of Rights of 2016. In 2015, the KBI started receiving these unreported sexual assault kits. And I wanted to give you a, little, a few numbers or statistics on how many we have received. Since 2015, the KBI has received 1,038 unreported sexual assault kits from, from medical facilities. In 115 of those cases, the victim subsequently came out or came to law enforcement and decided that uh, they wanted to report that crime to law enforcement. Those kits were removed, they were moved into a reported status, and then they were tested and examined. However, unfortunately, over the past six years, 211 kits have been destroyed per the statute. 
and those kids will never be able will never be able to to move forward with that those cases. Currently, 712 unreported sexual assault kits are currently being stored at the KBI Forensic Laboratory. With House Bill 2228, uh, the proposal to extend that amount of time from five years to 20 years, it will prevent the destruction of evidence prior to the end of the statute of limitations. It will allow victims to have his or her day in court, and it will hold a, uh, offenders accountable. The, if we, once this thing is, once this bill is passed, uh, we anticipate that those 712 um, kits that we currently have in, in storage will then be converted to a 20 year time frame. Finally, I'd like to talk about the access to victim services in Kansas. Currently, there are areas of Kansas in which victims have to travel significant distance to get to medical providers that are specially trained in evidence collection. Uh, sometimes up to four hours just to get to a, a facility that can do that. House Bill 20, 2228 would allow for evidence collection to be completed through by specially trained medical personnel in child advocacy centers throughout the state of Kansas. This would allow better uh, uh, increased accessibility to trained medical f providers and increased access to services, especially for children because that's really what the child advocacy centers are geared towards. Um, in summary, House Bill 2228, it aligns st Kansas statutes with national best practices and recommendations of the Saki Committee. It provides provisions consistent with the Federal Survivors B Bill of Rights. It improves law enforcement and criminal justice response to sexual assault in Kansas. And it increases accessibility to sexual assault victim services in Kansas. We appreciate the consideration of House Bill 2228 and request your support of the bill. I'd be happy to stand for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jacobs. And committee will go ahead and reserve questions at the end of the uh, oral testimony provided today. Thank you. And we're going to go a little bit out of order, uh, committee, on the oral proponents and ask uh, Mr. Ed Klump to testify next, he is the legislative liaison for the Kansas Association of Chiefs of Police, Kansas Sheriff's Association, and the Kansas Peace Officers Association. Welcome again to committee. Thank you. Um, I am here today to, to testify on behalf of the three associations you mentioned, and I appreciate that. It saves me having to rattle those off. And uh, we are in full support of this bill. There's a couple of key points I want to make, and then I think there's some others that can talk about some details of aspects of this that don't directly fall under the law enforcement realm. But first of all, I want to talk about the accessibility of the sexual assault testing, and, and much of this bill is uh, designed to improve the accessibility to obtain these uh, testing kits uh, and, and get the examinations completed. Those examinations are absolutely critical in our investigations. They're critical in a lot of aspects, not only in identifying the suspect in many cases, um, in some cases, it's confirming who we are told the suspect is. And just as importantly, sometimes it helps us eliminate somebody who potentially could be convicted wrongfully of, of a sexual assault. So these ex sexual examinations are very important. And it's not just DNA. There's a lot goes into these sexual examinations that provides us expert uh, testimony of physical examinations of these victims that helps us support uh, the case that that the assault was a forcible assault. So there's a lot of aspects of this that's very, very important to our investigations. And these enhancements that are put together by people who are experts in that area of the bill, uh, which I'm not, uh, I, but I was on that group as we worked through this, and I'm very confident they've done a very good job of putting this together, having the right people listed in the bill, and, and the uh, right improvements to improve that accessibility. The second thing is on the policy uh, requirement, which does directly affect us, and we support that. Uh, we, at this time, we don't know of any agency that's not submitting to the, to the KBI. But we do believe having written policy is a good practice to have so that uh, the importance of this carries
carries on from one administration in an agency to another. And so we support that uh, part of the bill. We, we would echo what the revisor told you about moving that date out another year to, to make it consistent with the intent of the bill when it was introduced last year. It's important for us to have that time to, to get everything in place. Um, and uh, we, I don't know if it was mentioned yet, but uh, there was a uh, model sexual assault investigation policy that was put forward uh, during the work that was done over the past several years. Many of our agencies have adopted that, so this isn't going to be a new policy, but it'll probably require some modifications in, the, in some of the policies. So this is very important to us. It's very important to our investigations. More. Uh, importantly, though, it's critical not only to providing the right service to the victims, but also uh, identifying who is the correct suspect and who is not the correct suspect. And so we urge you to pass this bill favorably. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Klump. Uh, next, we will hear from Lindsay Ford. J.D., a public policy attorney with the Kansas Coalition Against Sexual and Domestic Violence. Please introduce yourself and welcome to committee. Hi, thank you. My name is Lindsay Ford and I am the public policy attorney with the Kansas Coalition Against Sexual and Domestic Violence. Um, KCSTV is a coalition of 25 direct service provider programs across the state. They serve domestic violence and sexual assault victims um, throughout the entire state of Kansas. I am here today to share with you some of the impacts of this bill and its passage on survivors of sexual assault across the state. Um, as, as Robert Jacobs outlined, this bill would improve sexual assault response across the state in a number of ways. Um, most significantly, it would ensure that all of these exams that survivors submit themselves to are reported and tested and adequately shared with prosecutors. One of the most difficult things that a survivor in the aftermath of an assault can do is seek out help and make a decision to report their assault. Um, I, don't, I don't know if many of you are particularly familiar with the process of a sexual assault forensic exam, but it is a very invasive and arduous process. It can take several hours. It involves photographing sensitive areas where damage might have been. It involves swabbing and very detailed efforts to collect evidence. And it's by nature of, of the examination and the requirements to get evidence in a timely manner, it's done in the immediate aftermath of a violation of someone's personal autonomy. So for a survivor to go and to submit to one of these exams, it is a difficult choice. And so having an opportunity for this exam to be submitted and tested in a timely manner is respectful of that process and of that decision and it would benefit survivors greatly to have the reassurance of knowing that the legislature supports their efforts to seek justice and to access justice and for that reason alone this would be a wonderful bill to have passed um i've been i've been doing this work for almost a decade now and i've sat with survivors through that process and it is it is very challenging for them. And I have also sat with them in the aftermath when they have learned that, you know, for whatever reason, their case may not be prosecuted and their, their kit still hasn't been tested. And so being able to provide them with the comfort and reassurance that that is a process that is fully, fully respected and fully undergone would be tremendous for survivors. Additionally, as, as the previous two proponents mentioned, providing increased access to these exams would be beneficial to survivors across the state. We have a very large, very beautiful, very rural state, and there are many areas where survivors have to travel hours to reach a facility where they can properly undergo an examination. And as I said, the examinations themselves can be 
hours long. We're talking potentially four to six. So if you include four hours of travel time, you now have a survivor seeking services, spending eight to 10 hours just trying to get an examination done. Um, and again, in the immediate aftermath of a sexual assault. That's, that's a significant burden to place on our survivors. And then lastly, as, as again, the previous two proponents said, um, having the evidence stored for 20 years gives survivors the opportunity to, to make a decision to prosecute or to report when they are ready, not, not in a specific time frame. It gives them a chance to come to terms with what they've experienced, and it gives them a chance to make a decision in the aftermath of that, after they've had time to, to fully process the things that have happened to them, if they need that time. And so storing the, the kits for 20 years, given the fact that we no longer have a statute of limitations, would give them that additional time without risking losing the evidence that may be needed to, to proceed. So I just want to conclude by saying that we, we're talking a lot about numbers and about kits and exams, but at the end of the day, every single one of those numbers represents a person who has experienced some sort of sexual violence and some sort of associated trauma. And I just really want to remind us all that we don't want to lose sight of that as we're looking at information about statistics and investigation and all of that. We are still fundamentally at the end of the day talking about rape victims or victims of sexual assault across the state. And again, I want to thank you all for your time and I would be happy to stand for questions at the end. Thank you. Uh, next, we will hear from Ilsa Necht, uh, Director of Policy and Advocacy, Joyful Heart Foundation. Uh, do we have Ms. Necht in the committing meeting room or online? I believe she's online. If you want to um, introduce yourself, that would be wonderful. Uh, we're hearing that she was scheduled to be uh, online and is not at this time, so we will circle back before we close the hearing um, to see if she is available online. And that brings up next then Flannery Houston, Director of Programs, RISE. I don't see uh, Ms. Houston in the committee meeting room. Uh, is she online? No, not either, so... Okay, uh, with that then, we'll give them a few minutes and we will open it up for questions of any of our conferees from the committee members. Yes, Senator Thompson. Thank you, Madam Chair. And this would be either for Mr. Jacobs or Ms. Ford. Um, just as a matter of uh, logistics and everything, just curious uh, how big these kits are and whether or not you uh, say, when you save them, do you save the actual kit or do you save just the digital results? Just back of the envelope math tells me that by 20 years, you're going to have 6,300 kits. Is there an issue with the storage? Is there an issue with how it's stored and any degradation of evidence over that time period because of storage issues? Just curious about that. Mr. Jacobs, if that's something you can answer, go ahead. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Um, that's a yes. great question. Go ahead and introduce oh, yourself sorry. again. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Robert Jacobs um, with the Kansas Bureau of Investigation. Um, that's a great question. Uh, the kit is about this big. It's, it's, it's a relatively um, it's a small cardboard box. Uh, it has multiple items inside of it. And, and you're absolutely right trying to do the math on, on storage. Um, the KBI has looked at additional um, storage capabilities to do that. Uh, we have identified a way to do that. Um, the, as far as uh, refrigeration or anything like that, we don't have to, the, the kits don't contain anything that have to be refrigerated. Uh, they currently are stored on a shelving system and that's what we would continue to do. Um, the one thing that I will say though is that it, it's hard to predict the number of kits that we're gonna have because we can look at how many we've received each year However, that number has grown each year. So you can't just take five years worth of kits and multiply it by four because it continues to grow. And so 
So we, it, the number is, is kind of obscure to us, but we have planned for that. Uh, we do have funding already available to, to increase our storage capacity of those kits. I think that answers the question. I, I appreciate that. I was just thinking about that. The other quick, if I could follow up, uh, obviously collection of this sort of data, time is of the essence. So, I mean, to me, it makes sense to open up the ability to have more uh, locations to do the testing. Uh, is there any quality control issues that you foresee, you know, with the application of those tests in, in various remote areas where the training might not be uh, as good? Are you, I'm, I, I apologize. This is Robert Jacobs again with the KBI. Are you referring to... Uh, collecting the kits, right? Uh, or collecting, or actually yeah, them. actually the actual tests. You know, collecting the tests, and, and I think it's a great idea that you have more opportunity and more places to do so. I just want to make sure that you know, obviously there's a quality control issue there that you want to make sure there's good evidence um, that's going to be useful in the future. And I, I just any thoughts on that? Absolutely. And again, that's, that's, a, that's a good question. We, um, part of this bill states that the people who would be collecting that, those kits or that evidence, um, whether it's at a CAC, a medical facility, a doctor's office, or anyone else, they need to be specially trained. And those requirements are in there, and it's actually outlined in, in statute as to what their special training is for that. So quality control, we're, we've, I think, are pretty set with that. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Committee, other questions? Thank you, Mr. Jacobs. Thank and you. I am also glad to hear that we have uh, quality control measures in place and training requirements for this very sensitive area of our law enforcement um, needs as we go forward and that there is funding available for it already in place. That was going to be one of my questions. What are we looking at as far as is this already provided for? And I'm glad to hear that as well. And um, some accountability that this is in place for the longer period of time since we have a longer statute of limitations to be taking a look at this. So it all sounds like it's quite helpful in this area and uh, something we need to address. We don't have any other further committee questions, it doesn't look like, so we'll call again to see if our other uh, oral proponent conferees are online. Uh, Ms. Ilsa Necht with Joyful Heart Foundation. Are you online? Doesn't sound like it, and we don't see from our IT folks that um, she's there. Or Flannery Houston with uh, Rise. And again, not seeing that. Do we have any uh, oral proponent conferees in the committee meeting room that I haven't called yet? Yes, go ahead and please state your name uh, and if you're with an organization. Uh, good morning, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Michelle McCormick, and I'm the Director of Victim Services for the Kansas Attorney General's Office. We must have had a glitch. I thought I was down for oral testimony. Um, Apologize but, for no, the oversight there. Thank you for uh, stepping forward. Yeah, absolutely. Thank Welcome. you for the opportunity. And really, I'm just, uh, you have my written testimony, but also um, I would just really echo uh, the testimony of my colleagues, but wanted you all to know that the Office of the Attorney General is a part of uh, the multidisciplinary group that took a look at this and uh, we are in support of the bill uh, not only because of the criminal justice benefits that you've heard about but also uh, to provide the opportunity uh, to get justice for victims and survivors and so just wanted you to be aware that we're in support of this bill that our office is involved and so just wanted to share that with you today so thank you very much well great appreciate that uh, any other proponent conferees in the committee meeting room. Any questions um, for, tell me your name again, I apologize. Did we get that, um, Ms. Sage? Did we get her name? I'm Michelle McCormick, thank you, Ms. McCormick. Uh, any questions? Uh, yes, Senator Baumgartner. Thank you, Madam Chair. I am hearing that Ilsa Necht is on WebEx, but it says the meeting hasn't started yet. Thank you. I just saw that same text uh, from our vice chair. Can we start the WebEx meeting? Have we done that virtually? There's two people in the meeting in it right now, but not our scheduled conferee, it looks like. Could um, 
Ms. Necht, if she's listening, email, send her email to our committee assistant, kim.sage at senate.ks.gov. Or can we get it directly to IT and what would be the email address she could send it to? And while we figure that out, um, I am going to ask, are there any neutral conferees in the committee meeting room? Any online? I don't see any. Is that, there you go. Thank you, so we don't have to have her share her email address online <laughs> with the public here. Um, I don't see any neutral proponent, or excuse me, neutral conferees in the committee meeting room and none online. And so we will ask for any opponent conferees in the committee meeting room or online. Seeing and hearing none then, we will go ahead and is the proper procedure to uh, we don't want to close the hearing on HB 2228. We want to keep it open, but move on to other business while we're waiting for her to get online. So, so that's what we'll do. We'll suspend uh, the hearing on HB 2228 right now so that Miss our other conferee can um, get connected and we will hear from her. With that then, the other order of business is an informational hearing and discussion on possible legislation regarding the governor's most recent executive orders. There were two executive orders regarding uh, staff in hospitals and nursing homes and um, places of health care. And we will ask our revisor, Mr. Thompson, to please brief us on executive order number 2201 and 2202. And I apologize, it's the revisor from health committee. So uh, please introduce yourself and welcome to committee. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. I am Scott Abbott with the Office of Revisor of Statutes, typically handle staffing the health and budget committees. Uh, happy to make a cameo appearance in your committee here today to give you a briefing on the two executive orders issued by the governor uh, on January 6th. Those are executive orders 2201 and 2202. And as the chair mentioned, those relate to the licensure and practice of certain healthcare professionals uh, in healthcare facilities and adult care homes to provide some additional flexibility by suspending some requirements related to those professions. So Executive Order 2201 uh, is likely familiar to many of you. It is substantially the same as Executive Order 20-26 that was initially issued back in 2020. Um, that has long since expired, uh, so this would renew the provisions of that executive order. Additionally, during the 2020 special session of the legislature, uh, those provisions were codified into statute that became 48966, uh, but that statute also expired by its own terms on March 31st of 2021, uh, so those provisions are not currently active. The executive order provides that certain healthcare providers may perform additional acts without the normal regulatory or statutory supervision requirements uh, that are related to those acts for a number of healthcare professionals and individuals. Um, I've listed on the memo you should have received all of the professions and categories of persons who are affected. Uh, for each of those, the executive order sets out some additional specific tasks that they are authorized to perform. Uh, including many mid-level healthcare providers, physician assistants, uh, various categories and capacities of licensed, certified, or registered nurses, uh, students in medical programs or other healthcare programs, volunteers, uh, a number of other healthcare professionals who would be able to perform additional acts uh, without the typical required supervision requirements. Uh, additionally, the executive order would allow a healthcare professional who is licensed and in good standing in another state to practice in the state of Kansas to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, it additionally provides liability protection from criminal, civil, and administrative proceedings for those persons uh, when they are acting in accordance with the executive order. The executive order additionally allows a professional whose license has lapsed within the past five years to renew that license without uh, some of the typical regulatory or statutory requirements, including examination, fingerprinting, continuing education, and the payment of fees that are required for those licenses. 
Additionally, professional certifications in basic life support, advanced cardiac life support, first aid, all remain in effect during the effectiveness of the executive order and the state of disaster emergency. Fingerprinting requirements that are imposed as a condition of licensure for hospitals, nursing homes, county medical care facilities, and psychiatric hospitals are also suspended during that time. Additionally, there are provisions for broader liability protections for any health care provider who is covered by the executive order, who is performing services there under, uh, for liability protections for them as they are performing those tasks. Um, I would point out that the executive order contains this liability provision that was handled separately and differently by the legislature back in 2020. Um, those provisions in the original legislature's COVID response bill were broader and, and handled kind of in a different manner. Um, so just wanted to point that out. Uh, so Madam Chair, that's executive order 2201. I can pause there for questions or I can continue to the other executive order if you would like. Sure, we'll take any questions now. Thank you from committee members. Yes, Senator Haley. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, uh, thank you, Mr. Abbott. Uh, very briefly, to what extent beyond traditional um, medical and health care providers would this go? For example, um, uh, a licensed optometrist or a dentist. In fact, I actually had a, a request from a member of the dental community. Would this extend to those that are non-traditionally um, the fields are not related, or to what extent might they be able to be implemented? Mr. Abbott. Madam Chair, Senator, so the, prof the categories of professional that are covered specifically by the executive order, um, those are the ones I listed on the first page of the memo. Um, the executive order makes specific provisions for each of those for additional tasks that each of those professions may perform under the terms of the executive order. And then the kind of expanded reciprocal practice provisions that allow the professionals licensed in another state and in good standing to practice in Kansas, um, those, uh, by the terms of the executive order, are related to the response to COVID-19. So that's partially delegated to the regulatory bodies to make that determination for those professions. Um, but more specifically speaking, it's, it's those professions that are listed on the memo and in the executive order. Thank you, Mr. Abbott. Asking for a friend. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. So Executive Order 2202, uh, this is also similar to an executive order that was issued previously. I forget the number of that one. Um, this was not codified into statute like the one I just discussed, um, but this executive order is related to the licensure certification and registration of persons who work in adult care homes specifically. Uh, the executive order directs KDADS to suspend uh, any renew or extend any renewal deadlines for any occupational or professional license uh, that is issued by KDADS or any of the authorities that, is, uh, that are under the jurisdiction of KDADS. Uh, additionally, authorizes KDADS to issue a temporary license certification or registration for a person who was previously uh, issued a license certi certificate or registration within the previous five years. This is similar to that renewal provision in the, the first executive order. Uh, additionally, directs KDADS to extend deadlines for continuing education requirements and to waive any late fees that are associated with any of the extended deadlines or temporary licenses that may be issued under the authority of the executive order. The executive order also expands the use of temporary aid authorizations and it allows the use of that authorization for any person who receives minimum training uh, as determined by KDADS, uh, subject to some limitations and minimum requirements, as well as temporary authorization for persons who were not previously licensed, certified, or registered, uh, again, subject to specific minimum requirements and only authorizes the use of those individuals in very specific circumstances uh, for individuals who require minimal supervision or assistance in an adult care home. Uh, finally, that executive order modifies existing law or the operation of existing law in KSA 39929. That statute allows KDADS to issue a provisional license to an adult care home that may not be able to strictly comply with some of the statutory requirements for the licensure of an adult care home. Uh, it requires for this provisional license under the executive order uh, that the adult care home submit a checklist on a form approved by KDADS for their plan of isolating and cohorting residents in response to COVID-19. Uh, it also requires the submission of a plan uh, for those actions. 
and it suspends a requirement. Typically, the state fire marshal has to approve of this provisional license, but in this circumstance, if KDADS approves of the checklist and plan, that requirement for state fire marshal approval is temporarily suspended. Uh, Madam Chair, that is Executive Order 2202. I should note that they were both issued on January 6th, uh, and without action by the legislature, by law, they will expire a week from tomorrow, Friday, uh, January 21st. Uh, and so I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Abbott. Committee questions regarding Executive Order 2202. Senator Thompson? Not on 02. Can I, uh, I can wait uh, and go back to 01, but I did sure, have Sure, any question. questions on 01 or 02? Yeah, uh, on uh, 2201, Scott, uh, with regard to the liability issue, is it because we, we provided some temporary liability in SB 40, uh, I'm assuming that is all expired because that's, or, or does this reinstate that liability that was under SB 40 because we're now under a quote unquote emergency declaration? Go ahead, Mr. Abbott. Madam Chair, Senator, uh, so I do not believe, and, and Jason might be able to correct me if I'm wrong, I think some of those liability provisions from Senate Bill 40 that were originally in the 2020 special session bill, some of those are still in effect through March of this year. I forget the exact date. Um, so those are kind of, those dates are disconnected at this point. Um, like I said, the, the provisions of statute that codified the previous executive order, those are expired. But the liability protections, at least some of those are still in effect right now. Um, the provisions of the executive order overlap with those statutory liability provisions. But like I said, you all handled that separately and, and kind of in a different way. So there's overlap. They're not exactly the same. And there's not really a conflict between them. Um, they both relate to the COVID-19 response and the liability of healthcare professionals. So both are kind of in effect at this point. If I could just follow up. So, and the reason for this questioning or line of questioning is that um, during the course of all of this, I, I personally know some people who were denied treatment options and do not have the ability to, to sue uh, and go after. And it, it seems to have elevated the level of um, um, the hurdles you have to jump over to to go after somebody for negligence in care. Uh, so I'm, I'm guessing this would still put those barriers in place. I, I'm just trying to see, because I've had people ask me, say, I, I would like to go after a physician or a hospital on these situations. And what, what position does that put them in? Thank you, Mr. Abbott. Uh, Madam Chair, Senator, so you are correct that the provisions of the executive order and those statutory provisions that you all extended in Senate Bill 40 um, are a higher level of protection than is otherwise provided by law without those provisions. Um, without speaking to specific circumstances or, or cases or facts or anything of that nature, there is that higher level of protection. Um, so people who, uh, somebody who may have had a cause of action before against a provider may not while those provisions are in effect. Thank you, Mr. Abbott. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Senator Baumgartner. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I think we all remember um, the horrific oversight that we had from KDADS with regard to our assisted living facilities, um, where in fact those individuals that had reduced training and licensure um, did not receive the training that was required for many months, many months after um, the initial shutdown in March two years ago. So with this new Executive Order 2202, what has the governor done to assure that by reducing the licensure requirements, particularly for assisted living facilities, that those individuals have actually received the training. We know there's been a lot of churn that's occurred, um, not only in our hospitals, but also in our assisted living facilities. And again, what I have argued for, it's now been almost two years, our hospitals have the higher trained, higher licensed employees. 
That is not true of our nursing homes, our assisted living facilities. So what has been done by KDADS, do we know, to assure that that training is occurring um, and is in compliance with um, CDC guidelines? Mr. Abbott, if you're, able, if you're able to address that, that would be helpful. Thank you. Madam Chair, Senator, I can't really speak specifically to your question. I think the department or somebody from the governor's administration would have to speak to what they have actually done on the implementation side. Um, as far as the text of the executive order and the legal effect of them, um, that language is all the same or identical to what that language was previously. So any concerns you may have had with the implementation of that previous language, I couldn't speak to. There's, there's no difference in, in the text of the executive order. And when I was looking at it, when it first came out, I didn't see a change in the language either. And so once again, um, I am concerned. We know that there were extreme shortages of PPEs, um, particularly in the assisted living facilities. Um, while we heard from then Secretary of the Department of Health that we had, we were flush with supplies. In fact, they were being warehoused and stored. And that was true for our hospitals, but not true for um, so many people. You know, people don't think of the hospital as their home, but in assisted living facilities, that is their home for Kansans. And so I am concerned about, um, once again, for that group, reducing the requirement for skills um, and licensure simply because we know that KDADS has not kept up with the training. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Other questions? Uh, could you, I have one, could you please clarify for the committee and those following along online and in the committee meeting room, procedurally, uh, the LCC took a look at this, and would you please, if you can, update us on, on what happened in that regard with these executive orders? Sure, Madam Chair. So last Friday, the day after the executive orders were issued and the state of disaster emergency was proclaimed, uh, as required by statute, the Legislative Coordinating Council did meet. Um, the governor's office did provide the Legislative Coordinating Council with a briefing on the contents of those executive orders. Um, under statute, the LCC has the authority to revoke those executive orders. They did not do so at that meeting. Um, that's essentially a summary of what happened. Thank you. Other questions, committee? Seeing none then, we do have, thank you very much, Mr. Abbott, for your um, information and testimony today. We do, committee, have proponent, um, I'll call it proponent, written testimony or um, explanation from uh, Tara Mays, Vice President of the Kansas, Legis excuse me, the State Legislative Relations person for the Kansas Hospital Association. She is also in the committee meeting room. If you could uh, come up, Ms. Mays, and give a perspective on the executive orders from the Kansas Hospital Association. Yes, Madam Chair, members of the committee, thank you so much for allowing me to come and speak before you. Um, I am Tara Mays with the Kansas Hospital Association, and um, on behalf of our 122 member hospitals, want to want to thank you for having the discussion on the importance of the executive orders and how they are helping our hospitals at this critical time. Um, Kansas hospitals, as you might imagine, we certainly would never have wished to be here and didn't think when we all adjourned back in May that we would be here where we are today. Um, but our hospitals are continuing to serve on the front lines and responding to quite an influx of patient volumes at the current time. Um, and we believe that the current executive orders, 2201 and 2202, have really begun um, to provide our Kansas hospitals with some of the needed tools to address some of the concerns and challenges um, that we are experiencing in being able to ensure access to care for patients during this time with historic patient volumes. As many of you have probably heard, our hospitals are feeling really the effects of a lot of varying challenges right now. 
Um, several of those um, I've listed in my written testimony, but they include things that we deal with on the day-to-day -day basis, routine care, um, but also a lot of delayed care, folks that have delayed care over the last two years. We certainly have an increase in COVID-19 cases, um, both the previous Delta variant and the current variant, as well as increases in regular seasonal um, viruses that we're seeing throughout the communities. Um, we have an increased need for early intervention treatments, those like monoclonal antibody therapies, and we have very limited supplies at this time, and we also have an overall global supply issue, uh, supply chain issues that we're faced with. But I think most pressingly, and like many other industries, our hospitals are really facing a lot of workforce challenges. Um, staff in our hospitals are subject to a lot of the same overall community spread that you all are seeing throughout the state of Kansas and are being impacted by isolation and quarantine and exposures for themselves as well as their family members. And they're being stretched thin and they're trying to provide all the care that they can for patients with very limited clinical resources. Um, these realities are really contributing right now to increased emergency room volumes, increased wait times, um, bottlenecks in our inability to transfer patients between facilities. Um, we have decreased inpatient services that we're able to provide right now. And while we really do remain hopeful that this current difficult combination of challenges is short term, um, these flexibilities and these executive orders are really crucial and they've come at a critical time for our Kansas hospitals. Um, unfortunately, um, we believe that the reality is is that the peak of our hospitalizations has likely not yet been reached. Um, the extensions that these provisions will enable Kansas hospitals really to access additional resources as we continue to develop contingency plans that help us to address the health care needs of our communities. And so we, we believe that the continuation of these very reasonable regulatory flexibilities will assist our hospitals in their current efforts to ensure this patient care. And we thank you for the opportunity to appear before you and we're happy to stand for questions at the appropriate time, Madam Chair. Thank you, Ms. Mays. Committee, are there questions for the conference? Yes, Senator Thompson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Tara, for being here. Um, I think it was December 31st, the FDA uh, finally ended the emergency authorization use of the PCR test because they admitted that there was they, it could not differentiate between COVID and influenza. And yet, I know that there's a lot of, of situations where testing was required to obtain certain procedures. So we are relying on false information, creating a bottleneck for the hospitals uh, for you to do your job. Can you speak to that? You know, I, I think you, you, you bring up a good point. It's something we have to be sensitive to in a couple of ways. Um, whether those tests for those patients coming in, um, they do have to be screened for, for illnesses um, such as COVID-19. And really, whether those patients are being screened for COVID because they have COVID or because they have another respiratory virus that's impacting that testing, we still have to take traditional uh, precautions with that particular patient on the staffing side. So for us, it's really a matter of um, being able to treat that patient no matter what their condition is at the current time with the appropriate PPE and, and the ability to staff for, appropriately for that patient care. Uh, one last. Uh, is there a, a, across the hospital system in Kansas and the various hospitals you represent, are they, uh, <laughs> those screening processes using the PCR tests or whatever antigen tests, uh, limiting access to health care. I think there's a variety of, of uh, things that are happening right now that might be impacting access to care. I'm not sure that I've seen any data um, from our hospital association uh, members that are tying it to the testing component directly that I can share with you. But I'm happy to look to see if, if anybody's had that experience or are willing to share some data and information on that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Committee, other questions? Senator Gossage. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for being here, Tara. Um, 
Just this past week, the Director of International Infectious Disease at Mass General Hospital said that they see, um, they, they expect that as far as the population of the country will end up with a 20 to 50 percent positivity rate when it comes to Omicron. And February will be a cleanup mode. March will begin to return to normal. The surge will peak between January 10th and January 21st in the Northeast. Given that information, do you know if we have a, is there an ending to this executive order and when is that? So the current ending, I believe the revisor mentioned is January 21st. Uh, and I appreciate that question because I, I think we're watching those trends that you mentioned very closely. And we remain very hopeful that it will be quick and pass through quick. And so our hospitals are very focused right now on getting through the next few months um, and this surge currently and are very hopeful that after that things might start to decrease in terms of rates and kind of that stress on staff that I mentioned. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Committee, other questions? Seeing none, then I have one last one. If this were to be extended through legislation, which I think there's um, some bills in progress to see this um, extended past the January 21st, 2022 date, what's the position of the Kansas Hospital Association as far as an, an ending date to these kind of provisions? Yeah, I appreciate that question very much. Um, and as I mentioned, um, we are really focused on getting through the next few months. I believe the date on some other legislation that's out there on the House side is May 15th at the current time. We would be very hopeful that that would allow us um, to, to be able to, to deal with the current patient volumes. Um, of course, if the legislature, you know, depended upon the date that they would look at to extend these, um, we would uh, be happy to come back and provide some updates on where we're at um, as we get closer to that end date. But I think right now, um, 15 days has um, allowed some of our hospitals to stand up some of the regulatory provisions, but it's not been enough probably for all of us to take um, advantage and full advantage of the regulatory relief. And so uh, in terms of a date specific, I don't think we have one. We're just really focused on getting through the next few months. Thank you, appreciate that. Uh, with that then, I will ask, are there any other conferees in the committee meeting room who want to uh, offer some proponent testimony? Oh. I think there's uh, one, if you'll please uh, identify yourself and, and who you're with and welcome to committee. Thank you, Madam Chair. Jason Watkins on behalf of the Sedgwick County Commission. Um, I don't have, written testimony, I will get it to you. I was just reached out to this morning by uh, my county commission um, requesting that if there is going to be legislation uh, and it would not slow down the process. I, I've talked to the representative from the Kansas Hospital Association um, and, and my county certainly gets the importance of what is going on and, and, and the critical nature of what they're dealing with. So. Our request would be that if there is going to be legislation and it doesn't slow the process down in any way, negatively affect our, our hospitals, that county health departments uh, would be included. They're struggling with the same situations as the hospitals. Our, our, that's health officials at a county health department are not immune from what's going on, same as it's affecting our, our staff in the hospital. So. Thank you, Mr. Watkins. Any questions for the conferee? Seeing then, none, thank you. Thank and you. are there any other conferees in the committee meeting room or online for the executive orders? Seeing and hearing none then, we will uh, thank everyone for their information provided today on the executive orders and that's an issue that legislature will continue to take a look at here in the next couple days. And we will then go back to our hearing on House Bill 2228, and I believe Ms. Necht is online and ready to give her testimony. So if you'll please introduce yourself. And welcome to committee. Hi, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Wonderful. Uh, thank you so much for um, inviting me to testify today, and sorry for all the confusion. Um, a lot of great people have testified before me, so I'm, I'm going to shorten my testimony a little bit. Um, I am um, 
I just want to start by saying I have a very soft spot in my heart for Kansas, um, as that is where my grandfather landed to farm after coming over from Denmark in 1917. Um, so I have Kansas in my heart. Um, so I'm Ilsa Connect, and I'm the Director of Policy and Advocacy for the Joyful Heart Foundation, uh, which was founded by law and order actress and advocate Mariska Hargitay to help survivors heal and reclaim joy in their lives. And in 2010, we made eliminating the rape kit backlog our top priority. We strongly support HB 2228 and the mandatory testing of rape kits, which you have heard has um, been identified as a national best practice by the United States Department of Justice and is being adopted in states across the country. If Kansas enacts this bill, the state will join 34 states and Washington, D.C., recognizing the importance of testing these kits. So again, I, I'm going to make this a little bit shorter, but I want to go back to talking about the sexual assault kit initiative in Kansas. Um, in 2017, um, the initiative reported that out of 496 tested kits, 30% 30, uh, 30 of the identified offenders who had been known to the victim and had trackable previous offenses were high frequency offenders. So these offenders had committed sexual assaults prior to and after the rape kit collection. Um, so this group of criminals committed a combined total of 1,075 violent offenses. The testing of these kits also discovered that among the offenders with a post-kit collection sexual offense, 66 committed an average of four or more sexual offenses per offender. So these uh, three things this committee should know about this. These were kits that originally were likely deemed not worthy of testing because the victim knew the offender. Now we know that that approach to testing kits is mis misguided. Rapists are serial offenders and they don't stop until they're stopped. Even more, rapists are often engaged in other kinds of crimes like uh, burglary and domestic violence and homicide. So while rape kits sat on shelves in Kansas, dangerous offenders were operating with impunity and traumatizing victims. But because of the hard work of the Saki Project and uh, led by Ms. Katie Weissman, who is, I believe, in the room today, Kansas eliminated its backlog. And I wanted to say that the only way to ensure that this does not happen again is to mandate the testing of all rape kits connected to a reported crime. And the only way to gain compliance and create a uniform statewide policy is to put that into law. So codifying the policy also withstands changing administrators and changing priorities. By requiring every sexual assault kit to be swiftly submitted and tested, Kansas can send a powerful message to survivors of sexual assault whose body has become a crime scene. And you, know, you heard um, about that process of what it takes for survivors to have evidence collected from their body. So we can send a powerful message to them that what happened to them matters and that they matter. Rape victims, no matter what their zip code is, should deserve to know that their kit will be tested. I'd like to take this opportunity to also encourage legislators to build on this reform and adopt a statewide rape kit tracking system that will increase accountability and transparency through the kit handling process. And it will allow victims to track their kit online the same way they can track their package on Amazon. Um, and there are federal grants available for this. Um, 30 states have already implemented those systems. So I just end with saying, please consider us a partner in this work and a resource as you work to create safer communities and bring a path to healing and justice to all sexual assault survivors in Kansas. And thank you so much for allowing me to speak today. Thank you, Ms. Connect, and thank you for getting connected with the committee today, um, despite the technology um, hurdles we had. Committee, do we have any questions for Ms. Connect? I don't see any, so thank you very much for your testimony today and the work that you're doing. With thank that, you. then, we will close the hearing on HB 2228, and committee, we do have on the agenda uh, working bills previously heard. And I also do want to let committee know and uh, those following online that committee is scheduled generally from 1030 to noon is our allotted committee time. So um, everyone please budget for that. And with that, I would like to work House Bill 2228, but I'm not sure it was quite ready because we have those technical updates because it's a carryover bill and dates that would need to be extended. So I'll ask the reviser with those technical updates and the dates that need to be extended if it's the will of the committee to adopt those amendments, is that something we could go ahead and work today if those amendments are ready? And they are. So if um, we could go ahead and pass those out and I'll 
be the carrier of those amendments. That's um, helpful and wonderful. And we will ask um, Mr. Thompson to explain those. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Jason Thompson with the Reviser of Statutes again, for those listening not in the room here. Um, so this that you're receiving is what we're calling the technical update amendment from our office. Um, it simply changes the, the dates and, and makes sure we're amending the right version of the statute uh, so that everything is, is done correctly. Uh, you'll see there's not a whole lot of, of change in it at all. Um, mostly just states. I, I would note that um, this does not address the issue on page one in line 27 about the date of the policy implementation. Uh, to us, that was not a technical issue that we could fix. So I'll leave that aside for you to, to consider separately as a basically a policy choice for the committee. So bear in mind, if you adopt this, you might still want to address that date in line 27 of page one separately. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Committee, any questions for the reviser on the amendment or uh, discussion on the amendment? Uh, seeing none, uh, I'll, I'll move the adoption of the amendment. Do we have a second? Uh, second from what well, I was looking over here and heard over here, so I'll go looking uh, at Senator Gossage seconds the motion. And with that, then, uh, we'll have a vote on the motion to amend House Bill 2228 with the technical update that's before the committee. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Those opposed, same signal. The motion to amend carries. With that, then, we will turn back to the bill. Do we have any other amendments? Do we want to take a look, committee, at the date in on page one, line 27, that the policies required be adopted and implemented by all law enforcement agencies prior to July 1st, 2022? Or is the committee comfortable with keeping that date? Yes, Senator Thompson. Uh, I, I'm comfortable keeping the date as long as it's possible to be implemented in that kind of time frame. And I don't, uh, I, it sounds like the KBI has already done their diligence on the storage issues and things of that nature. So I, I think I recall from the testimony that the date wasn't a problem. Um, we have our conferees still in the committee meeting room, but I, I don't recall that the date is a problem. So um, we've, we've closed the hearing on HB 2228, but uh, Mr. Thompson, would it be proper to ask a question of a conferee who's still in the committee meeting room? So we'll, we'll go ahead and, and proceed with that. Then Mr. Klump, looks like you had some input on the date and whether our law enforcement community could be up and running by then on this issue. Go ahead and introduce yourself again, please. Ed, Ed Klump, and I represent the Kansas Association, Chiefs Police, Kansas Sheriff's Association, and the Kansas Peace Officers Association. And yeah, it would be helpful if we change that date. Um, depending on when this actually gets implemented, if it doesn't go into effect until July 1, then it could be a challenge to get everything in place that quickly. Uh, so. Uh, the intent of the original bill was to put it a year out for the actual policy to be in place, and that's the practice that we've done on every other policy requirement that we've implemented over the years. And so that would be our request that you change that to 2023. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Klump. So with that committee, I would entertain um, an amendment by voice to change line 20. I would um, be open to an amendment such as that to Senator Thompson. And uh, Madam Chair, I will offer that amendment to change the date on line uh, 27 uh, from July 2022 to July 1st, 2023. Thank you. Is there a second to the motion? Senator Corson, thank you. Any discussion on the amendment? Senator Baumgartner. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I do see that at the end it says that it would be uh, take effect and be in force 
after publication in the statute book, do we really think it's going to need more than a year to put this in place? Could we change it to, I don't know, January 1st of 2023? And, uh, Madam Senator Chair, Thompson. I would be, uh, I would certainly think that's a, a, a probably appropriate and a better idea. The faster we can implement this, the better. And just following the, the, uh, Suggestion of the conferee, but I, I agree with Senator Baumgartner. I would amend my uh, motion to make it January 1st of 2023. So do we need a substitute motion, Mr. Reviser, or? So uh, Senator Thompson, if you would withdraw the previous motion and does that need to be approved by the person who seconded it, if we have approval from both, then we can submit a new okay, amendment. Okay, I withdraw my original motion. Madam Senator Chair. Corson? I'll withdraw my second as well. Thank you. Go ahead, Senator Thompson. And I, I would, you know, I appreciate the discussion here. We did hear from law enforcement that it's the general practice that we, in statute, we codify they have a year to uh, implement changes such as this. Uh, we do have discussion that, well, since we have so many practices in place already in this regard and for this particular change, maybe a whole year isn't necessary. So uh, I would open it up for discussion once we have the amendment. And, and I would go ahead and offer the amendment that we change it to January 1st, 2023, the uh, date on line 27. And considering it's January 13th now, they have, it's almost a year for them to implement this, just a little shy of that. And I, I think that would make common sense. Is there a second to the motion? Senator Baumgartner. I second the motion. Thank you. Discussion on the amendment? Seeing and hearing none then, we will go ahead and vote on the amendment on page one, line 27, to amend the date from July 1, 2022 to January 31st of 2023. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed, nay. The motion carries. With that, we're back on the bill. Any other amendments? Hearing none, any other discussion on the bill? Hearing and seeing none, then is there a motion regarding the bill? Senator Baumgartner. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move that we pass out HB 2228 as amended favorably. Thank you, is there a second? Senator Thompson, thank you. With that committee, any further discussion on the motion? Seeing and hearing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed, no. The motion carries. Thank you, committee, for your work on HB 2228. It will be reported favorably out of committee. And with that, then, we don't have anything else on our agenda for today. We do not have a meeting scheduled for tomorrow. And with Monday, the holiday, there is not a meeting scheduled for Monday either. So we will have committee meeting then on Tuesday morning. Thank you very much, and have a safe weekend. We are adjourned. Thank you.